Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here today. I am not the illustrious David O'Leary, but I am Ryan Garfinkel. I'm joining you here today from the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, and we are delighted to be here at, at this Alternative Pathways Conference because we are so uh, in need of tertiary prevention programs like the ones that CEP has laid out, like the ones that many of our speakers are going to talk about here today. They're an integral part of a public health informed approach to targeted violence and terrorism prevention, which is exactly what our center aims to help create in this country. And it exists in small pockets all over the country, in large part due to people like yourselves around this room. But we're here to try and make and grow this approach to violence prevention because we all know that prevention is possible. So when I say a public health informed approach to violence prevention, what I mean is that we're taking the full spectrum of activities from primary prevention activities where we're engaging with people and we're trying to raise their awareness that prevention is possible, that there are tools out there and people out there who can help them if they have concerns or want to do something in this space, that there are secondary prevention programs in place to both assess potential threat, right, because if somebody just doesn't like me or you and decides that they want to, you know, they have a problem with us, there should be somebody to screen whether or not we are in fact posing a threat or maybe there's a different resource that could help resolve whatever's going on there. And then we need, of course, secondary prevention resources that can manage folks. So it's not enough to just say that there are people of concern, you then need to get them resources, otherwise we're not actually able to prevent something bad from happening. And then, of course, there's what we're all here to talk about today, which is tertiary prevention programming. Because if we're successful in the primary and secondary stages, that's awesome. But occasionally, some of those successes mean that folks will be in carceral situations, they will be exiting hate groups. There are folks who are going to need a type of services that primary and preve secondary prevention services just aren't set up to give. So tertiary prevention is a vital part of the prevention ecosystem. And if you don't do prevention on the reintegration end of this, you aren't buying down the risk that you've set up a prevention ecosystem to take on. So today we're going to be talking a lot about good work being done in tertiary prevention here in the US, in other countries, and we're also gonna be talking a lot about the ways that civil society, government, state, local, tribal, territorial, federal, all forms, NGOs, can work together in this space. Because tertiary prevention is a small community within the small community of prevention practitioners. So I'm very glad to be in this room with you all today. I'd like to turn it over to our colleague, David Ibsen, the executive director of the Counter Extremism Project for more. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Ryan, um, for that uh, uh, introduction. And thank you all for joining us today uh, in person. I know we have many, many people joining us uh, virtually uh, as well. Um, so as uh, Ryan said, as the director of the Counter Extremism Project, it's a pleasure, uh, again, to welcome you all. Um, we have a great program and a great lineup, I think, for you all today. Um, I look forward to engaging with the program, look forward to engaging with you all, uh, learning uh, from you all uh, about your vast experiences working with uh, individuals who have been convicted of terrorism-related offenses, um, your work with them in prisons, and also um, outside in the post-release uh, environment. And we'll have a chance to engage uh, with all of you and learn from each other, I think, uh, throughout the day. Um, with our distinguished partner from the Alliance for Peace Building, um, all of the uh, esteemed practitioners and experts who are joining us here and taking part in the program. I think that uh, we're going to see that there's uh, an opportunity uh, for all of us to, again, to learn and uh, work together to find out how to better support reintegration, uh, rehabilitation efforts um, of convicted terrorists and achieve our shared goal of reducing recidivism uh, in the long term. Um, so with that, you know, in 2018, um, CEP published a report. It was called When Terrorists Come Home, uh, the Need for rehabilitation and reintegration uh, of America's convicted jihadists. And, and the report at that time um, noted that um, since the 9-11 attacks, there was 900 individuals who had been prosecuted for terrorism-related offenses. Um, and at the time of the publishing of the report, 247 of those individuals had already been returned to society after completing their sentences. Um, and that within five years, another 25% of those 
would also be returned to society. So the report was published in 2018, five years, it's 2023, that's, that's this year. So um, clearly there was a need to address this problem. Um, and that's why CEP, we brought together experts in the counterterrorism fields and the recidivism reduction fields uh, to launch this alternative pathways program, which was funded generously by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and the goal was to work with convicted terrorists and those with susceptibility or affiliation with uh, violence-oriented extremist movements in uh, American prisons. So CEP's Development and Program Managing Officer, Dr. Juncal uh, fernandez Garizabel, will be speaking, there she is, at length uh, in detail today about her experiences interacting with both um, people from uh, both jihadists and also from the right-wing adherents during the past 72 months. But just allow me uh, to stress and note the critical commitment of DHS to this program. Um, and express our, our gratitude. Their support enabled us to adapt, well, develop alternative pathways and adapt it to circumstances uh, on the ground, um, make it more viable, um, deal with pretty extraordinary circumstances, not just trying to implement a program in a prison setting, a prison environment, uh, but also doing so uh, during a pandemic. Um, so there was a lot of challenges, but DHS was very, very supportive through this whole process and let us uh, adapt. And I think ultimately produce some evidence-based interventions that can be scaled nationally. So clearly there remains a demand to address the uh, rehabilitation, reintegration needs of the convicted terrorists in the U.S. Uh, the number of domestic terrorist-related um, investigations grew by 357 uh, percent between 2010 and 2021. And uh, I believe data from the Justice Department released in 2023 shows that there's 23 new additional um, uh, domestic terrorism prosecutions, which is a 143% increase um, over 2018. So they're very unsettling numbers, to say the least, but I think it does show that um, there's a need for this kind of work. There's a need to ensure that people working on rehabilitation, people working on reintegration uh, of extremist-related offenders uh, have adequate knowledge and access to evidence-based reintegration support mechanisms. Um, you know, just to follow up on that, in building on alternative pathways, we were fortunate to have the support of DHS for another program, which is the Radicalization, Rehabilitation, Reintegration, Recidivism uh, program, or 4RN. Um, this brings together individuals um, who are encouraging a whole of society approach to extremist and terrorism, or terrorist offender reintegration and recidivism reduction, and connects people responsible for the monitoring and supervision of such individuals, either in prison or post-release in the community, um, to professionals with expertise in reintegration and de-radicalization oriented programming. So this network, this 4RN network is active, it's functioning, we're already implementing the trainings, has about 100 members so far of the network. If you're not a member and you're interested, you can go to our website, 4rnetwork.org, or see me or Hunkal or any other member of the CEP team throughout the course of the day and we can tell you more about this uh, program and how you can get involved, we're very, very excited about it. Um, an additional plug for Hunkal's good work, uh, we're also working in, as a trusted partner uh, for rehabilitation and reintegration uh, for other governments globally, other NGOs globally, namely uh, with the support of the State Department in Tajikistan and in uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, to enhance government-led uh, and in-community reintegration and rehabilitation programs. Um, so specifically, we, and there's not a mouse in my pocket, we being Hun Kal and her team, uh, are working to strengthen the capacity and capability of stakeholders and frontline practitioners uh, to appropriately respond to the psychosocial needs and the risks of returning foreign uh, families of FTFs, mainly women and children who have already been uh, repatriated to the, two, to the two countries. So whether in Central Asia or the U.S., CEP understands the successful rehabilitation and reintegration depends on not just the individual returning to the community, but also the context in which uh, they reintegrate, in which they return. So our goal is always to foster locally-led, context-related, relevant initiatives that create networks with awareness, training, and relationships to identify and prevent violent uh, extremism, which of course is all of our all of our goals. So before I turn it over, I would just like to run through a few brief housekeeping items. Obviously, um, today's event is being live streamed, it's being recorded, with the exception of the 12 p.m. Uh, panel, which will be conducted under Chatham House rules. That's the reforming in prison and post-release programming for violent extremism related offenders. Uh, all the panels will be followed by a Q&A if you uh, would like to ask a question or make a comment followed by do you agree question mark. Um, please just raise your hand, we'll bring you a microphone. Uh, when you pose your question, um, please just state your name and your affiliation, your organization. And then finally, the conference will be followed by a cocktail and networking reception um, at the end located in the fourth state room 
down that way. So please stay uh, to the end of the program. So today's program, I think, is going to offer us a fascinating look at all the good work uh, that you all are doing. I want to thank in advance all the organizations, the professionals who are participating. Um, and um, with that, I'll give a warm welcome to Elizabeth Hume, the Executive Director of the Alliance for Peacebuilding. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Before we go forward, I want to go back. And I want to go back to the greatest decade of all times, the 1990s, as a Gen Xer. Um, great music, great fashion, and one of the most peaceful periods of my lifetime. Uh, we had, you know, there, were, there was conflict, for sure, but the Cold War had ended. Uh, we had peace agreements in Bosnia and Kosovo, not perfect, but we had them. We had the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, you could, even when we went into Iraq, we, the Russians said it was okay to do that. It was a, it was a period where the multilateral worked and conflict was on the decline. And then 9-11 happened. Um, well, actually, I want to say just another reason, uh, the doomsday clock was, it is the time where we have been the farthest away from midnight, 17 minutes in the early 1990s. I, I'm sure you all can guess where we are right now. I think it's what, like 30 seconds? Um, so we are in a very volatile period. Um, but what came out of the 1990s is 9-11. Well, 9-11 came. And it kind of shook us all up. Uh, what does that mean for the US and safety here? We had to think about how we were looking at development assistance differently. You know, I used to say it was location, were you close to Europe, like Bosnia or oil, right? Now we had to care about ungoverned spaces. Um, so we had to look at it completely differently. I went to work, I came back from Afghanistan, and I went to work uh, at USAID. I helped start up the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. We couldn't even say prevention at that time because we couldn't do it. We didn't know even what we were doing. Um, it was like turning, I, I say it was like turning the Titanic in uh, getting people at USAID to think about conflict, prevention. Uh, Julie's laughing because she was, we started on the same day at USAID and we were trying to work on these issues together. Uh, you would go to one of the bureaus and they would say, Liz, please go away. Um, we don't want to talk, you know, this isn't conflict. We have our education program, we have our health program, we have our, and conflict has increased. 2018 hit record uh, violent conflict um, globally. That was before COVID. That was before technology uh, that, uh, that's hit. Um, Afghanistan, Sudan, Ethiopia, Israel, Palestine, Nagorno-Karabakh, it's increasing. And right here at home, for the first, well, not for the first time, in the last period, we now have seen that violent extremism homegrown, the call is coming from within the United States, is our greatest threat to our national security. And we were a little behind because 9-11 happened, and it's understandable. Patriot Act, we were so focused on protecting the homeland from outsiders that it was very hard to get the government to think about the homegrown issues that were coming. And so, you know, I have to say, um, when this administration started, we were thrilled that DHS was picking up the phone and calling us and saying, you know, we got to change, we have to adapt, we have to do things differently. And while things are doom and gloom, there's a lot of hope out there because we know a lot. There's so much learning out there. And you'll hear a lot about that today, globally, but also domestically. You know, going back into 2004, um, when I was at USAID, uh, you couldn't, you know, everything was countering terrorism and security focused. We were working with the highest levels of government, trying to get them to say, you know, we didn't even know what to call it. We called it the softer side of countering terrorism. Um, but we know a lot more. At that time, we were throwing jobs at it. Jobs, 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 jobs. Not good. 
spoiler alert, that wasn't the issue. So we really focused in on how do you adapt? How do you learn what's not working, what is working? So why am I telling you all of this? Why, why did I go back 20 years? Because we have learned a lot. And we know a lot of the drivers. We know some of the things that are working. We still have a lot of gaps in research. Um, but we need to do more. And that the Alliance for Peace Building is a membership-based organization. We have over 200 members. Our whole goal exists to advance and build the field through policy advocacy, through evidence-based work. We are here to amplify the field and work collectively. So I don't need to go into all these statistics, but we know there's a significant rise in domestic terrorism here in the United States. And this afternoon, I'll be moderating a panel where we talk about the most frequent targets of attacks for government, military, law enforcement agencies. And we know there's been a major historical break that very focused on ethnic, lone wolf, so you get where I'm going with this. We have to adapt and we have to learn and there's lots of things that we can apply. But we have to say some of our theories of change, we just made them up. There's no evidence to back them up. Some of them don't work. Some do work, but you have to do this with it. Um, so we, I, I cannot stress enough, I was talking with Julie about this earlier, evidence. We have to ha get the evidence right the impact, and then how do we apply it. So I'm grateful for the incredible knowledge that's sitting in this room. But we have to do better also with applying it for our programs here at home, and also look at policies that have to change. The fact that $20 million is the Department of Homeland Security budget to work on these issues, that's not OK. That's not enough. We advocate for 100 million. We advocate for the fact that we have to be working with health and human services. Because as Mike will talk about later on, the brain science and the health components to this. So I want to say join us. Um, and we have to work collectively to amplify this work here in the United States. We have no choice because conflict drivers are increasing. And it's also not just the things that you think they are, right? So I'll leave you with one thing. January 6th happened. I got it completely wrong about who I thought was there. Completely wrong. Some might say I'm a conflict expert. Totally wrong. If you go to the University of Chicago data, They've done a deep dive on every single person that was arrested, the people that breached the Capitol. And you know what they found? They're people from ex-burbs, like Loudoun County. They're white. They're middle-aged. They, they wouldn't subscribe to QAnon. And they're well off. They're from some of the richest counties. They're accountants. So please, I know we're going to be focusing in on you know, some of those violent extremists, but we also have to be focusing in on those unusual suspects that are uh, mainstreaming this and normalizing it uh, in the United States today. So I'll leave it at that. I am so excited to hear from everybody today, and uh, let's get started. <laughs>